Welcome to Under the Radar, a show about independent iOS app development. I'm Marco Arment. And I'm David Smith. Under the Radar is never longer than 30 minutes, so let's get started. Um, so today we are kind of doing the part two to last week's kind of, I don't know, going indie 101 or going indie the spreadsheet way um, discussion where we talked a little bit about forming a forming your business, uh, considerations around taxes and considerations around income. So if you haven't heard that, you know, go listen to that before this before you listen to this because those are more important in some ways and more foundational to kind of what we're going to talk about now. Uh, but really, what we're going to be unpacking for the rest of this episode is trying to think through all of the different expenses that you are going to have um, once you kind of work out at a vague level what your income goals may be, what the taxes around that are going to be, um, and then you have to like work out well what are the other expenses when suddenly if you're self employed and you're becoming um, you know, suddenly becoming responsible for all of the expenses associated with running a business. Um, what are those going to be? So you're not caught out or surprised uh, by what they, they may be. And um, some of these you may not have thought of, but the one that we're probably going to start with that you almost certainly have thought about if you live in the United States um, is healthcare and health insurance. Uh, because almost certainly if you work at a, a traditional employer currently, they're, you know, that employer is providing in some way um, your your health care. Either they're paying for it themselves or you're paying for it, but they're choosing it and it's a group plan. Um, and this is something that I feel is so often the – it can be a little emotional and personal because, you know, health care is a very um, – it, it's, not, it's not this kind of – it's not like choosing your business card provider or choosing – you know, which computer you buy, like those decisions, while important for your business, perhaps like aren't nearly as personal and impactful to things that other than you, you know, this affects your family and it can affect, you know, your family in a very substantial way. Um, so it can end up being, I think, feeling something very scary. Uh, but I would encourage you to always think that health insurance is just another number um, that you have to pay for. And it's not, you know, it's like it, it can easily become something that is a bit, you can build it up to be something that's a bit more emotional or a bit more scary. Like, you know, right now my employer just takes care of that. Now I have to do that. It's like, well, hey, you're kind of already paying for it now because um, you're, you know, it's not like your employer gets their health insurance for free. Like they're paying for it for you. And that's in some ways your money that um, is just being there, you know, they're, they're having control over it. So at least one advantage of, paying for your own health insurance is you can, you know, tailor and choose and match it to your family's needs, goals, risks, tolerance, savings, uh, et cetera. Like you can choose that, but ultimately just understand that, um, it is just a number. It is something that you now have to choose and make that and those choices can be complicated and, you know, kind of, um, challenging perhaps, but it is just a number. And once you turn it into a number, I, f I found for myself that it made it a lot less scary, a lot less problematic that I could just say like, okay, I'm going to spend this amount of money on healthcare. I put that into my budget. I put it into my spreadsheet. It's, and then it's just, it's just covered. It's taken care of. I don't have to think about it or worry about it because, you know, ultimately that's all it is. It's an expense. And then, you know, it'll have implications perhaps, you know, per in your personal life in terms of the different, depending on the kind of insurance you have, you know, when you go to a doctor, different things will happen. You may have a high deductible or you have to pay a copay. And, you know, the, the, that part of it is certainly something that you can, is worth considering. Um, but it's not this big, scary thing. It's mostly, it's just an expense and it's pretty expensive. It's probably after taxes, your next biggest expense, um, uh, but it's not anything more than just another number and just another budget item that you have to take care of. Exactly. Like the the debate in your head should not be like, I, I can't go indie because I would need to pay for health insurance or, or I wouldn't be able to get health insurance. In, instead, it's when I go indie, I have to find a way to make, you know, X extra dollars per month than what I than what I might have originally thought because it has to pay for health insurance. Because, you know, like, as you mentioned, like, you know, right now, like, someone's paying, you know, wh whether you're paying for part or all of it yourself, or chances are your employer is paying for, you know, part or all of it. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot that employers pay to have an employee that is not just the salary that you get. And, you know, we started talking about this last week with, with like, you know, the employer half of a lot of these taxes, um, and other various, you know, employ employment taxes that, that you will have to either pay or, or pay some kind of alternative to now. Uh, but also, you know, healthcare is part of that, you know, just office expenses. Like, you know, if, if they pay you, say, $50,000 a year, you might be costing them 
$65,000 a year or $70,000 a year or more, like, you know, depending on ha- what kind of expenses they have to have employees. And, and so when you go independent, it's not that you can't do that. It's not that you can't pay for those things. You just have to know how much to charge for your consulting services, how much you, how much income you need from products, like stuff like it, it's, these are not numbers to scare you off, but to instead inform how you make your projections, how you know what you need, and how you set your prices. I remember early days when I was doing consulting, I would sign a contract to do a, a work. And it, the number, like the income that I was getting seemed so big and so like, wow, that's like, that's a lot of money. Like I'm going to, you know, like this contract is for $20,000, like, which in a, in regular day-to-day life is a lot of money. Like, but it, the important thing that I always had to, in the back of my mind have, and this is just a rule of thumb that I found to be pretty helpful is to say like, whatever that top of the line number is, it's like ha- at least half of it is going to something else. Um, and so like, it's not that I didn't, I didn't just make in that, in this, in that example, I didn't make $20,000. I made $10,000 and that additional 10,000 is going to be going to all manner of things, taxes, healthcare, office expenses, et cetera. And so it's important to just have that in the back of your mind that, you know, like these are all just numbers that you just have to balance and know what they are, but you know, it's, it's good. To, and the reason you're doing this is so that you can make sure you're charging enough because, you know, ultimately if you don't, then that's when things like healthcare can become problematic because you need to be, have the money to, you know, to afford to pay for it. Exactly. Because like you were, as I, like I kind of said last week, like your whole mindset of like how to pay for things has to change to some degree. And your mindset about how much money you need to make also has to change because like your whole, like if you've been, only employed by other people until now your whole life up until now you've had a certain amount of money in your head is like what's a, what's my salary or what's a good salary or what kind of salary do i quote need you know to 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 maintain the lifestyle i want to maintain and you you still have to make those kind of calculations the numbers just have to be higher and it's not that like you know the the idea of spending say two thousand dollars a month for family health insurance which is a reasonable number actually these days which is sad but like you know the idea of spending two thousand dollars a month if you are getting paid in you know a regular middle class job, that sounds insane. Like that sounds incredible. Why would anybody? How can anybody pay that much? But the answer is not thinking of it from the from the point of view of a payroll employee. Thinking about it as the point of view of somebody setting prices for a business to know like okay, how much income do we, do we need every month? Do we need eight thousand dollars a month of income to sustain what we need? Okay, then that's the number. Like you know, it's it's almost and and you figure out how to do that. You know, you you kind of back solve. You start with what kind of income do I need to cover all this stuff? And then you back solve to say, okay, how do I get there? You know, like a, a quick story here. Like when we first moved to New York, we, we moved to a very nice suburb and I, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I moved to where my cousins live because it was nice. And I got an apartment there, you know, just renting. And I looked around and, you know, Tiff and I were early in our relationship and we wanted to, you know, get married and get and buy a house. And we looked around the neighborhood we were living in, which was a very, very expensive neighborhood. And, all the houses were like a million dollars and so, and sometimes even more than that for like a basic house. So rather than do what we eventually did, which is move somewhere cheaper, I, I initially thought, well, I guess if a house is a million dollars, I guess I have to figure out how to make a million dollars. <laughs> that like informed like salary negotiations, <laughs> like all sorts of things until I eventually realized I could just move somewhere cheaper. But like, <laughs> It was like that for a while. Like that's that was the right way to look at it, which was like, all right, well, here's the environment I'm in. I don't want to change the environment I'm in, or I had this certain goal that I want to reach. So rather than seeing it as this impossible thing that I can never do, instead say, all right, this is what I need to reach that goal. How do I get there? Like how do I how do I afford a house that costs that much? You know, and yeah, and so when you're looking at a business, you know, you you have to think like if the idea that I just said making eight thousand dollars a month as a minimum if that sounds crazy high to you, back solve a little bit and, and instead start thinking, all right, what could I do to make $8,000 a month? Uh, yeah. So that it is just numbers. Like it's, it's just, that's why I love spreadsheets for this kind of stuff. You just kind of work it out backwards. And one of the side note too, on a lot of these expenses is the one nice thing about business expenses is that almost all of them are tax deductible. Um, so it's also just something to keep in mind that the, you know, if, if health insurance costs you $2,000 a month, it isn't two thousand dollars in the in the way that you would have had that money after uh, paying taxes. Like there's, it's, it's, you don't want to go get carried away with like the discount that you're getting essentially. 
by things being um, tax deductible, but it is certainly something to keep in mind that a lot of these expenses are the, the, the raw number is much bigger than what it will actually end up costing you. Um, yeah, so it's not just, free, but it is yeah. discounted. It's like you're getting, you're paying, you get, you get like one third off, uh, you know, all these, a lot of these types of expenses. Um, but anyway, so back to healthcare, uh, there's really two ways that you can get healthcare um, in the U.S. right now, anyway. Um, and at least two main ways that I think I've seen people use, and I've used both of these myself. Um, the first, and this is often the easiest way when you're starting out, um, is there's a I don't know, it's, it's called COBRA. I don't know what that stands for, but it's the essentially in the United States, you your employer is obliged to allow you to continue on your previous group um, insurance plan premium uh, for, I think it's up to 18 months after you leave a, leave a job. Um, and basically you pay, I think it's 102% of the cost that your, the total cost that the pre- employer was paying. So um, whatever that actually is. Um, and you can just sort of keep whatever the insurance that you have now. Um, and this is a really useful thing, even if you don't end up doing it in the early stages of kind of working out, um, you know, putting together your spreadsheet about what going independent is going to be like, this is probably going to be your – it's often going to be your cheapest version because group insurance is just cheaper than individual insurance. Well, sometimes. Um, sure. I mean, not necessarily, but at the very least, it's a great baseline, and it's a really easy baseline because the number of working out what your the cost of your current plan is um, is should be relatively straightforward to you in terms of your employer should be able to either tell you that or it's on your payroll stub or whatever. And you can look at that number and you can say, well, I can just keep my current insurance – if, you know, if you assume you like it, I suppose, but like you can keep that and that should be able to get you going. You can't do it indefinitely. You know, it's for your first year, year and a half or something, but it's a good way to just kind of get started with this process. Um, and it has the least disruption to your family in the sense of, you know, your insurance just sort of stays the same. It's you're just paying all of it yourself rather than uh, sharing that expense with your employer. And if that doesn't work or if that, uh, but for whatever reason you don't want that insurance, um, the alternative is usually to go to one of the uh, healthcare exchanges. Um, used to previously, it used to be I, I went to like a insurance broker and worked it out that way. Uh, recently, I just go to healthcare.gov, like the um, Affordable Healthcare Act uh, insurance marketplace stuff, and you kind of fill in a bunch of forms. Um, it takes the process takes a little while, so if you're thinking about this process, like you can, it's probably wise to go through that. Um, and just understand what all the things you're going to have to do. Like you provide a lot of data and then you'll just, you know, be shown a variety of health plans and you can choose whichever one sort of fits your needs and your family's goals. And, um, you know, depending on where you are in your life and your family life, uh, different plans might make sense. And I will say it's kind of nice that I've been able to, as since I've been self-employed, um, I've been, you know, I was able to tailor my insurance based on, um, you know, life stage. Like when we were in the, the phase of life when we were, um, you know, having children, children, having the process of having children in the U S is very expensive. And so we had very good insurance, um, during those periods. And, um, as we've transitioned out of that phase, like I've been able to transition to slightly less robust insurance. Um, like I still have good insurance, but it's not quite to the degree it was before. And it is kind of nice to be able to choose that, but you know, you go through the marketplaces and you'll get be given a whole variety of choices of different styles you know, the, a large, a lot of them end up being the high deductible style plans, um, or you can, you can. There are still typically options for um, like the uh, PPO copay version of it, but you just kind of have to choose and decide. Pick a plan, and you'll, you know, it'll tell you. It's just like it's, it's weird, but it's kind of like just like you're just shopping for anything else online. Like you'll get a cost, um, and you just start paying that to the insurance company yourself. Yeah, it's it's way easier than it used to be. Like back in the, well, like when, when we had to go to brokers and everything, and and you know, not to get too political, but like before the ACA, there were a lot of uh, there were a lot more things you had to worry about. Of like, if you picked the wrong kind of plan, or if you missed like some small print, you might open yourself up to some major risks. Um, whereas with the ACA, it normalized a lot of that, and, and it put in a, put in place a lot of like minimum guarantees of levels of coverage, such that it's a lot less stressful than it ever was now to shop for healthcare. Yeah, and and so in that sense, like you just say, you decide what decide what plan works works for you, and then you just buy it, and now you have a number. You just put that in your spreadsheet and move on. And you know the big scary thing, oh, getting you know being self employed is really hard. Uh, to you know you wouldn't you 
because from a healthcare perspective, like it isn't really, it's, it's, it's expensive, but it's, it's not difficult. We are sponsored once again this week by FreshBooks. To all the freelancers out there, you know how important it is to make smart decisions for your business. Our friends at FreshBooks can save you hundreds of hours with their cloud accounting software for freelancers that is ridiculously easy to use. By simplifying tasks like invoicing, tracking expenses, and getting paid online, FreshBooks has drastically reduced the time it takes for over 10 million people to deal with their paperwork. For instance, when you email a client an invoice, FreshBooks can show you whether they've seen it, which puts an end to all the weird, awkward guessing games. Like, did, you, did you get the invoice? Did you see the invoice? And they have all, they're always adding new stuff. So for one of the things they've added recently is the new projects feature. This lets you share files and messages with your clients, contractors, and employees right in FreshBooks. See how quickly things can happen when all your conversations live in one place. So if you're if you're listening to this and you have not used FreshBooks yet, now is the time to try it. FreshBooks is offering an unrestricted 30-day free trial for listeners of this show with no credit card required. All you have to do is go to freshbooks.com slash radar and enter under the radar in the how did you hear about us section. Thank you so much to FreshBooks for their support of this show. Um, so beyond healthcare, there are probably a few kinds of insurance that you may need to think about. Um, these depend. Uh, you may want to have some kind of professional liability or errors and omissions insurance. Um, it depends on the kind of work you do. Personally, in my experience, I haven't uh, carried this type of insurance unless a contract requires it. So sometimes you'll be you know, doing a big consulting project and the people you're consulting with will – one of the clauses in the contract is that they require that you cover you – know, have a – professional liability insurance. And so you may have to have that. Uh, depending on your state, you may need to have things like workman's compensation insurance or unemployment insurance. Um, usually those only kick in if you have employees um, that aren't yourself or yourself and your spouse or something like that. But just good to keep in mind. I highly suggest not doing that if you could help it. Yeah. <laughs> it's having having any other full-time employees, like not, not just paying contractors here and there, but if you have any full-time employees it massively complicates a lot of these factors. And I I did it very briefly. I think you did too. I, I would highly advise if if you can do your work with just yourself and occasional help from contractors, do that. Yeah, and it certainly is one of the benefits of this type of work is that you probably won't need um, employees, at least to start with, in the sense of the work you're doing is just, you know, you and your laptop or you and your iMac uh, you know, working away, you're not, it's not like you need a, a production facility that you're like making widgets in. Um, and so hopefully you can avoid it or at least defer uh, having employees uh, for a while. Um, you also now may need to think about uh, retirement uh, types of in investing like 401k or IRA type of stuff. Um, this is something that, I mean, you, depends, it depends on how, how you view this type of thing. You could potentially defer this for the you know the first couple of years of being starting self-employed but that's up to you but either way it's not going to be something that your employer is providing anymore so it's something that you have to take care of yourself and if it's something that you would like to contribute to um, in your as you're setting up your business you know you have a lot of choices available to you um, I think the ones that most self-employers would use is the simple IRA or a SEP IRA seem to be the two that you will likely uh, may take advantage of. Um, interestingly, depending on your situation, they may actually be able to you may be able to contribute a lot more than you would have from a traditional four hundred one k. So some, that could be a benefit to you. But it's again, it's just another line in your spreadsheet that you need to understand. Um, and you're you're going to be setting up the plan yourself. Like you'll be going to you know a investment bank or you know Vanguard or somewhere like that, and you'll be setting up the accounts and making the contributions yourself. So um, that's just something you'll have to. That, you know, now as with all the stuff, it's like now, now that's your job. Now you have to take care of that. And if setting that up is scary to you, you know, be thoughtful about if if this really is for you. Well, and also like you know, you, you can also do things like hire a uh, a financial planner to talk you through a lot of this stuff. Um, especially when it comes when it comes to things like long term retirement savings and things like that. That that often helps. Um, I'm sure you know wh whatever accountant you have for your business to do your taxes, which you are definitely now doing. Um, that you know the accountant can probably give you some basic guidance on this as well. Um, to give you some idea of the much higher contributions, um, a SEP IRA, uh, the limit this past year, I believe, was $54,000 that you could contribute total. Now, there are some limitations on this. So, for instance, first of all, if you have employees, the whole thing gets messed up. Don't have employees. But if you <laughs> – so but, uh, but if you – I believe the limitation is it can be up to 25% 
of the business's income for the year. So if you want to contribute 54000 you had to make like 212000 know, or whatever. Um, but anything you contribute to the SEP, I believe, is either a tax deduction or a credit. It, it's, a, it's a big advantage in your taxes. Um, so like these are things that you know, any good accountant should tell you you should investigate. You know, if, if you have enough income coming into a business uh, where you, where a SEP makes sense, it can be a pretty substantial tax savings. Yeah. And, and the other advantage, too, that's just as a side note there is it's nice that you have more so much more control, as with so many of these things, over this. And so it isn't the kind of thing where you have to, like, on January 1st, decide what your empl- uh, retirement contributions are going to be for the year. You have a bit more flexibility about when you do that, about when you time that. So if you get, have a great year and you get to the end of the year, you know, you can make a larger reti- you know, re- retirement contribution that year so that you can lower your tax liability, um, if that makes sense. Like, there's lots of cool things that you can do because you have flexibility, because you're not just, you know, one of a thousand employees. And so you you, ha- you, ha- you actually have the ability to make these choices. Yeah. Also, by the way, if you didn't know about this stuff, it is not too late to do this for this past year, uh, because you can contribute to at least a SEP. I don't know about the other ones, but you can contribute to a SEP, I think, up through up until tax day, up until April or something. So, yeah. um, so like, you can do it for the previous year. Uh, so, so definitely, like, if you're into this for this year, ask somebody about it ASAP, because um, it isn't too late. And, uh, but yeah, it's, these are things that, you know, again, and, it, you know, like you said, with the, with the control, it's great, because, like, if you had a not-so-good good year, you can either skip it and not contribute, or you, you can contribute a smaller amount than you otherwise would have. If you had a fantastic blowout year, you can contrib- contribute as much as you possibly can. Um, you know, it's, it, it really puts everything in your hands, just like much of self-employment. Yeah. Um, other expenses. So you'll start to get into things that like just otherwise your employer would have typically covered for you. So things like, uh, mileage, uh, to or from consulting clients, potentially those type, that type of thing, or travel for work, uh, to conferences, any educational expenses you may have. So if you need to take a course or a certification or something like that for your, for your work, um, that's now like a, you know, a business expense and it'll you know, be deductible from your income, um, as well as just something you need to take into account that if, you know, if your employer every year sent you to WWDC and took care of all the expenses, um, that's now going to be you paying for that. And so working out, you know, what the costs are associated with that, whether that still makes sense. Um, you'll need to buy your own office supplies, you know, whether that is, um, you know, pencils and paper or if that's uh, business cards and letterhead. Like, I mean, depending on what kind of business you have, you may or may not need any of those. Um, but that's now something that you're going to have to take care of yourself. So you're going to buy your own coffee for the break room. Yeah, that's that's true. They, you, you can't you can't just uh, mooch off their terrible drip coffee anymore. So Ooh, I should get a water cooler installed in my office. There you go. <laughs> And that way you can have conversations with yourself there um, on a regular basis. Those are probably expensive. Can you ha- can you have a guy come and like bring those giant glass those giant jugs to it? Is that a thing you can do to your house? I'm sure if you paid for it, <laughs> they would be happy to they would be happy to bring the giant five gallon drums into your house at, uh, and set it up for you. It's probably not very cost effective. <laughs> you may a, a, just a, a tap with a filter on it might might, might be more effective for you. <laughs> probably it, just a guess. Um, so you may, you're now be responsible for your own hardware, um, in terms of, um, your computer, any testing devices that you now need, um, in terms of, you know, I mean, depending on the kind of work you do, you may want to have, um, a, a collection of test devices. That's now your responsibility to, uh, to purchase, um, probably also something just as a, it's, it's always a good idea, but I always want to mention it in this kind of topic is make sure you also like your one of your first purchases was probably going to be if you don't have it already like a good backup hard drive um, because suddenly now you are personally responsible for you know your work like if you somehow your hard drive you know your computer dies and you suddenly don't have that project that your your client has been paying you for six months to build like that is a tremendous problem so you need to make sure you have a very good backup situation um, both in terms of physical, you know, like having a, like I, I do a daily mirror of my main machine in addition to a variety of cloud backups, but like that's an, it's a hardware expense that you may need to, um, to factor in a really good chair. Uh, sure. If you sit in a chair for two hours a night after you come back from work, that has very different needs. And if you're sitting on one for eight hours a day, 
Yep. Yep. You'll have a variety of kind of home office things. Um, like, and I will say, don't go, don't necessarily go crazy right away. Um, it's, it's it, the, like we, as if you've listened to us talk for, for, for long enough, you understand we take these things very care, like seriously, like having good, good ergonomics, make sure you have a keyboard and a mouse and things that work. Um, uh, but, but like, if it's going to be hard to get started, like, you know, you, can, you these are the kind of things that can be nice goals for, um, you know, buying at the end of the year, if the year goes well, um, these are like you know, things that you can certainly, you don't need to do these right away in the same way. Like I, for my, for, to start with, like I didn't have that great of a laptop or that great of a computer. I just made it work. You know, you may not necessarily go out and buy a top of the line iMac pro on your first day of starting your new business. Like <laughs> yeah, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> that's probably unnecessary. Like you can kind of get started at, with what you have and then uh, grow and develop, um, as you have need. Um, you're also going to probably have to buy some software, like things that your uh, employer may have previously provided. Like if you use Photoshop or Illustrator um, or Transmit or Tower, like any of the kind of utilities and tools that um, are just sort of part and parcel of uh, you know, be, being an iOS developer, you're going to need to now pay for those yourself. Similarly, you'll have a bunch of online services that you're going to pay. Like I, you know, I have accounts with Dropbox. Um, you may have things with GitHub or Linode for hosting. Um, you have some, may have an account to something like FreshBooks or QuickBooks. You may, if you have any kind of web service, you'll probably have an account to like Pingdom or Hover. Um, you may be doing backups with Backblaze. Um, like you're, there's going to be a variety of these kind of services. And while any one of them individually is may not be that expensive in aggregate, you know, they're not an insubstantial part of your expenses. So make sure you have them in the spreadsheet and know what they're, you know, what, what, the, what kind of expenses you're going to have to to manage with that are. Also make sure that the licenses or the service plans that you are getting for things allow business use. Most of the things we've mentioned, it's the same no matter what you're using it for, but there are occasional um, services or some, or some software packages where like if you're using it for business use, you're, you're required to pay more to be compliant with a license. Yeah. It's just good advice in general. Yeah, it's pretty like, rare, but but th- those do still exist. Sure, or, or at least you know, make sure that you're being up for, uh, above board with all of these th- these types of things. I exactly. Mean, like, yeah, in- like this is not a place to like pirate your copy of Photoshop. Like you can't no, you can't do that with with business stuff. Because suddenly you're the liabilities that, that you're putting yourself under and your clients under and things suddenly become very problematic. So like in general good advice like be above board like understand that this is a business treat it as such um, and. If you factor these costs in correctly into your, you know, into your spreadsheet, into your expenses, like it shouldn't be a problem in that regard. And so um, it should be fine. And then probably the last area to think about is uh, professional services. So you're going, like we've talked about many times, you're probably going to need to have either a lawyer and an accountant or just an accountant or some kind of, in terms of some type of professional um, advice on the financial side. Um, you may also need to uh, periodically hire a graphic designer, um, not, ne- not not hire as an employer, but just hire in terms of, do, you know, do some consulting for you if you need, um, you know, even icon the icons for your apps or uh, an icon for your business if you think that's important or whatever. Like you, you're, these are kind of professional services that you're going to need to s- suddenly start paying for um, that you just need to keep into mind. And they're not typically crazy expensive. It's just an expense that needs to have its have a have a line item and be considered um, as you're going into this with your eyes open. This all sounds like a lot, and it is a lot when you when you've never done it before. But you know, it's not that different from like the transition from uh, renting the place you live to owning a place that you live, or the transition into being becoming a parent if you've done that. Like it's it's a thing where like you might not beforehand you might not have fully appreciated like all the things that were needed that were being done for you or that you that weren't necessary to do that now you have to do. Um, but millions of people do this. Millions of people have figured this out before you, many of which you are smarter than. Um, it's, it has a lot more to do with experience with these things than it, than it has to do with skill or intelligence or anything else. Like, if you want to tackle this, you probably can. Yeah, and I will say, too, it's probably just a good indication of whether you should. That, like, if the, if the thought of starting this process is completely overwhelming and you just can't handle it maybe being a regular employee is for you but if you can get over that like obviously we both recommend it we both like this lifestyle but it's probably a good litmus test for does this make sense for me that if the last you know this episode and the previous one is just like totally blown your mind then like 
okay, maybe it's not for you. And that's okay. Like this is like, neither one is like the right one, the right choice for you, but you just have to, it's a good thing to understand that these are, these are the things that you're going to have to take care of if you go down this road. Thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you next week. Bye.